Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name is Chris. I'm an alcoholic. You know, being up here in the pulpit has kind of inspired me, and I've I've learned to follow my intuition on these things. So instead of talking for an hour about emotional sobriety, I'm going to read some stories from this Bible for children. Well, maybe not. Okay. Um, let me think. Emotional emotional sobriety. Um, I got to go way back in my experience uh, to to be able to really paint. Uh, a decent picture of this. Um, some of my earliest recollections were recollections of self-centered fear. Uh, as a child, I seemed to be anxious, nervous, and high-strung a little bit more than uh, than, than normally uh, you would expect from a child. I remember uh, the time that my mother packed me into a car and drove me uptown to go to kindergarten. You know, it was my first exposure uh, being thrust into uh, uh, a group of uh, a, a group of people my age uh, for one reason or another. And I remember uh, I remember her letting me out of the car and I'm standing up on a hill and I'm looking down at these kids and they're down there uh, right outside the kindergarten and they're running around and they're playing and they're kicking ball and they're playing tag and they're laughing and they're already friends, you know. And I'm standing up on the hill looking down, feeling like a dick. You know what I mean? I'm looking down and I'm saying to myself, I am never, ever going to be able to go down there and integrate with these kids. You know, I mean, what if they don't like me? What if I say something stupid? What if I do something embarrassing, you know? What if I cry and, you know, and act like, I mean, it, it was just traumatic for me just to be able to go down there and be, uh, be with, uh, with the other kids. Right at that point in time, I could have used a double shot of whiskey. If you would have given me a double shot of whiskey, I would have been able to move right in there. You know what I mean? I would have felt comfortable with myself. I, I wouldn't have been afraid or intimidated by the, any of the other kids. Uh, but my problem was, was I was not exposed to any whiskey for a while. I think it was going to be about 12 more years or so, not 12, about 10 more years, about eight more years until, uh, until I discovered alcohol as a solution, uh, for that internal condition that made it very, very difficult for me, uh, to feel right about myself, right with myself and right with my environment. Um. One of the things that I discovered um, as a kid, I think I was about six years old or so, was the, the five-gallon jerry can, army jerry can of gasoline down in the basement. Has anybody in here ever sniffed gasoline? Well, i got to tell you, that's, that's an experience, especially if you're six. Well, what I would do is I would open up the top of this jerry can and I'd stick my mouth over it and I would breathe, directly breathe the fumes from this gas can until time got distorted. You know what I mean? I'd, I'd get to the point where I didn't hear things like this. I mean, I, I would be blown out of my mind. And I would wander upstairs, you know, banging off the walls. And nobody knew really what was going on. They just thought that I was acting like a kid. I was stoned out of my mind at six years old. And one of the things that I learned from, from that experience was there are ways to escape your emotions. There are ways to escape uh, from that, 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 that uncomfortable uh, existence that I had. You know, I, I'm not saying that I was always an unhappy kid. I'm saying that there were just times when I didn't feel right. Um, move ahead a little bit to uh, I'm 13 years old, and I decide that um, I'm going to cut school with a couple of my buddies. 
and we're going to go back to my house and we're going to drink some booze. We're going to t- steal a bottle of booze from my mother and uh, and get drunk. You know, uh, none of us had ever been drunk before. And it sounded like a cool thing to do, you know, for a little little pre-delinquent like myself. So that's what we did. We went back to, we cut school, we went to my mother's house, and I pulled down a bottle of Four Roses whiskey. Now, I had no idea how to drink. You know, I didn't know that you iced the thing down or you waited for it to breathe or you you found just the right mixer for just the right alcohol. I knew nothing about that. The only exposure I'd had to drinking was the John Wayne movies. You remember he'd bust through the saloon doors, he'd walk in, he'd walk up to the bar and he'd go, bartender, whiskey. And the bartender would grab a bottle and, you know, pour out a big water glass of whiskey and John Wayne would grab that glass and he'd shoot it back. And then he'd grab the bottle and he'd walk over to the table and sit down, you know, acting real mean. So I thought, well, that's what you do, you know. So I poured out these three water glasses filled with this nasty Four Roses whiskey. And I passed them out to my friends and I started drinking. Now, the one thing that, the the, the first thing I noticed was this stuff tastes awful. But, you know, I mean, this is, you have to drink it. Everybody's looking at you and you made this whole big deal up. So I started drinking this stuff, and the two guys I was with started drinking it. Now, looking back on this experience, which is how you really learn a lot of things in Alcoholics Anonymous, is you have to you have to go through them, and then you learn from the experience. Is that the two guys that were drinking with me? They never became alcoholic. To the best of my knowledge, they never became problem drinkers. Um, they alcohol became a non-event in their life after this. Uh, they drank about. Uh, half of their water glass, maybe a little bit more, and they'd had enough. They didn't need any more. They had had enough. Me, on the other hand, I finished my glass. I finished what they had, and I finished what was in the bottle. And I went into a blackout. Uh, I trashed the house, and I came to out in the field later with that lo- that first experience of lost time, which is the blackout, which is a whole stretch of time where you can't remember. And uh, uh, that's that's really scary to be a blackout drinker because you do some really weird things a lot of times in blackouts. And you come, you come out of a blackout and people are saying things like, do you know what you did? And I got to a point in my drinking where I said, don't tell me. Okay? It's just easier for me if I don't know. Um, so, so anyway... I come to in in the field, and I've got a nuclear hangover, one of those hangovers where you just have to be horizontal for a couple of days. I mean, there is no getting up and moving around. You're just sick as a dog. Uh, If if I'd have eaten cabbage and that would have happened or something, I mean, there's no way I ever would have gone near the stuff again because it made me so ill. The problem is, is that you know that repressed teenager? You know that that I was. Ta- I'm sorry, uh, uh, kindergartner that I was talking about the self-centered fear kid that just can't feel okay. Well, the alcohol cured that, only for a brief period of time until I went into the blackout. But I'd say after I finished my first glass of whiskey, uh, I was a different person. I was changed. I now felt the way I thought everybody else felt normally. I really thought that this alcohol gave me what people would normally had, which was courage and uh, and serenity and just, just being able to feel good about myself in any kind of social situations. You know, there was a lot in that glass of whiskey. There was self-confidence. There was, uh, hell, there's like dancing lessons in, in whiskey for me. I mean, you know, there, there's all kinds of things that I want, wanted uh, and wanted to be able to do um, was afforded me by, by this whiskey. So I became preoccupied with alcohol from that point forward. Um, yes, I understood that it made me deathly ill and I would have to uh, remain uh, separated from Four Roses whiskey for the rest of my life, which I actually did. But what I did was I started to experiment with different kinds of alcohol, with wine, with beer. Uh, I didn't seem to get as as deathly ill as quickly with those things. And I started to become preoccupied with where I was going to get the alcohol, who was going to buy it, 
um, where I was going to drink it, where I was going to get the money, you know, who was going to be around. I just started to become preoccupied with all this stuff. I started to schedule my day around uh, partying. I also come from a period of time when I started uh, drinking. It was like in the late 60s. And there was a lot of other substances that uh, you could get your hands on back then. And I uh, uh, I was a non-discrimination uh, type of uh, person. If uh, I, if you had it, I would try it. So I'm um, I'm doing a lot of drinking and I'm doing a lot of uh, a lot of drug use at that time. And I just became preoccupied with it. And uh, it kind of captured a lot of my time and a lot of my energy and things like schoolwork and stuff like that just was I was just not interested anymore. I, I come from a family where my brother and sister are both college professor PhDs. My mother and father were both Phi Beta Kappa masters programs and you know they're all educators and brilliant people. You know they read like Scientific American instead of People magazine type of people. And uh, so I come from a very, very smart family. Well, I graduated second stupidest person in my graduating class in high school. Um, you know, and, and that, that took a lot of doing to get that, that kind of a low D minus and still actually pass. Really took a lot of work. So anyway, uh, you know, alcohol really started to, uh, started to affect the way I was living. And more and more I needed alcohol for the social situations. I couldn't imagine asking a girl out on a date if I didn't have a really good buzz on. You know, what would happen if she said no? I, I would, like, crumble emotionally. I wouldn't be able to survive it. So I would get drunk and do it drunk. And then if she said no, I'd say, well, don't be begging me later or something. I mean, I, I'd have, like, a complete different change of attitude after uh, after some alcohol. So again, I started, I started using this stuff, and the alcohol consumption tended to exacerbate the problems I had with my spiritual condition, with my emotional condition. Um, things were not really comfortable in the beginning at age 13, 14, and 15, but as I began to use drugs and alcohol to cope, my ability to cope sober uh, became less and less and less, and, and I needed to uh, I needed to use the drugs and alcohol more and more and more. And somewhere along the line, I uh, somewhere I crossed the line from being preoccupied with alcohol to becoming obsessed with it. And they talk in the book Alcoholics Anonymous uh, about that. When that happens, uh, there's no going back through uh, your own unaided uh, uh, human will. You're uh, you're committed to alcoholism, and unless you can find a, a spiritual solution, you're usually doomed to die. Now, I don't know when I crossed that line. It was probably at a very young age, because you cross that line a lot, lot sooner than you cross the line of desperation to try to try to get away from alcohol, uh, and that's what that's what traps so many of us. Because by the time we want to quit, we can't. Um, I drank for 20 years. It got to a point in my drinking where um, uh, my life was, was becoming more and more uh, unmanageable, both internally and externally. Um, I really got to a point where it was difficult for me to deal with anything. Now, when I was in high school, I had some fun, you know, with, with, uh, with the drugs and the alcohol. I just remember these high school parties where, you know, you'd get, you'd get a little bit drunk before you'd go there and everybody would be having a good time and the music would be playing and there'd be fist fights and you'd like molest the women and, you know, they'd be okay with it. And, you know, and, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd be talking about all the things that happened uh, at school the next day at the party. And, you know, that was probably the last time uh, I really enjoyed, uh, you know, joy drinking or, or or any of the drug use was in high school, um, and for years I tried to capture, recapture that uh, uh, that experience. Um, I got out of high school and I took a year off, and I used to say to find myself, but I really that's the last thing I was looking for was me. 
uh, I took a year off and I just partied full time. And it got to a point where I was I was hanging out with younger and younger people because because the people my age were going to college or they were getting a job. Some of them were even you know falling in love and getting married and starting families. And uh, you know I'm still trying to live that live that irresponsible um, high school type life without, you know, getting jobs or anything like that. Just being able to do whatever I wanted to do whenever I wanted to do it. And it slowly dawned on me that that really wasn't working. So um, so I decided to go to college. Um, and, uh, you know, I took uh, real light college, uh, college loads and continued to party. And, and you can do that. You know, you can you can pass college courses and live a, live that decadent uh, type of lifestyle if you if you want to, and and I did for a while, uh, and then I ended up moving down to uh, down to Florida uh, to go to college down there, and I had hooked up with uh, this this marvelous codependent that came from a came from an alcoholic family. She was, I was like perfect for her, you know. She, I mean, she was used to the turmoil and the, the uncertainty and, and the, you know, the lunatic Jekyll and Hyde type of behavior. So going out with me was like going home. And, uh, you know, she ended up hooking up with me. And we, we went down to Florida and uh, ended up getting married. And I ended up dropping out of college so that I could work. And I, I pretended or made an effort to try to... Uh, to become a responsible human being. And that didn't work real well because I just didn't have it in me. I mean, you know, I'd do okay for a day or two, and then I'd go out drinking with my buddies and come back at like four in the morning. And I mean, I, I, I had no consistency in my life. I, I couldn't stay consistent with any one plan. I would always shoot myself in the foot and mess it up. Well, it got to the point where, you know, it was just so dysfunctional, this, this lifestyle that, uh, that she couldn't even take it anymore. Uh, and, and she was a, she was a, a black belt, uh, codependent, you know, and she couldn't even take it anymore. She ended up, uh, leaving and, and taking the kid and the dog and the car and the money. And I ended up, uh, I ended up doing a year on my own in Florida with, with two of the worst drinkers you could ever imagine. Uh, they're both dead a long time ago, uh, from liver disease. Uh, so, I mean, that's, that's the type of people I was, I was hanging out with. And, uh, again, this, this whole time, my, uh, my emotional condition is deteriorating. I would do really tragic, crazy things while drinking and then suffer the consequences the next day. I'll give you a couple of for instances. This one, for instance, we used to have parties at our house and we would be, you know, the houses were really close together down there and we'd have, I mean, have the stereo up to 10 and, you know, windows would be getting broken and there'd be fights in the front yard. And this one neighbor next door, uh, this, this, this woman was, came there to live with her mother because her mother was ill and wasn't going to make it very long or her mother had cancer or whatever. So she's staying with her mother basically to help her mother die. And it's one in the morning, and our house is like shaking on the foundations. And they decide to call the police. So the police come and break up our party. Now, I'm drunk out of my mind, and I'm upset that the cops have been called. So I take my buddy's sawed-off shotgun, my roommate's sawed-off shotgun. I take it outside after the cops leave, and I blow her satellite dish off of her roof. While I'm screaming, are you going to call the cops now? Are you going to call the cops now? You know, now, now this is, this is bad enough, okay? But I'm in a blackout. I'm walking down to get a ride to work the next morning, walking right by all these neighbors, you know, da 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 da. da and it, I remember what I did. And I go, oh my God, you ever get those, those memories? Like, oh my God, you, you remember what you did? And I, and, and so the whole day I'm just suffering. My head is about to explode with the remorse and the fear. You know, I've got to get to a drink. I mean, this is the, this is the way I'm living. I, I just did the craziest things. Well, Florida's getting a little bit too, too, uh, too crazy. I mean, I've got the cops after me because I didn't, didn't pay fines and do community service. I've got, you know, the ambulance companies are looking for money. 
Uh, the landlord's ready to kick us out because one day we ripped all the doors off of the house inside and outside and built a bonfire in the backyard. You know, just drug out of our mind. I mean, so we're in trouble with the landlord and now he can just walk right in, you know. So, so I mean, uh, I'm driving on a revoke license. You know, my, my boss hates me. I've got no money. Uh, it's just absolutely insane. What do you do when something like that happens? You start to think that mom might need a little help around the house, right? So I decide, you know, I'm, I call her and I tell her, I'm coming back to give you a hand. And uh, so I, I moved back there for like six years of the worst of my drinking. I lived at home with, uh, with my mother. She just didn't have what it took to throw me out on the street. She just didn't have that, uh, which is uh, kind of a shame. But uh, here I am. I'm, I'm living in my house now. I'm emotionally, I am a pathetic, tragic type of figure when, when I'm drinking. I, I'm one, I, you know, there's some, there's some types of alcoholics who sit at the same bar stool every night. You know, they're very predictable. They never do anything really outrageous. Every once in a while they'll get pulled over and they'll get a DWI. I think we all know that, that type. You know, they can handle their liquor or whatever. I was never like that. I could never handle my liquor. I was a tragic, pathetic alcoholic. I, you know, I would do things like this. I would get on the phone in a blackout and start calling people. I'll call like Mary Lou McGillicuddy from fourth grade. You know? I know I haven't talked with you in 15 years, but I love you. I mean, I do these like ridiculously, just embarrassing, horrible things, okay? So it got to the point where, uh, Here's what I would do. I would start drinking, and I know I'm going to get on the phone, right? I'd throw my phone numbers away. I'd do everything I could do. Finally, it got to the point where I started cutting the phone line. So I'd go down in the basement, and I'd cut the phone line. Because I knew once I started drinking, I'd pick up the phone. Well, I'm an electrician at this point in time, right? So I'd repair the wire when I'm drunk and then get on the phone. So I got to the point where I, I try to cut the line like right near a, a, a hole in the wall so it would be hard to patch. I'd rip the wall open and I'd patch it together drunk. It got to the point where I was throwing a ladder up on the side of the house and cutting the wire as high as I could reach on the outside of the house, the phone wire. But I'd, put, I'd get drunk and I'd put the ladder up on some boxes and get up high enough to, to splice it back in. Well, it got to the point where there was so much static on this phone, you couldn't even hear yourself talk. So we had to call the phone company. And the phone company guy comes, and he looks it over, and he goes, What the hell? It looks like somebody just chopped this phone line in about 30 places and scotch-taped it back together. And I go, Yeah, I, the house came that way. That's what I thought it was, too. I mean... It was just uh, the things that I the things that I would do were were uh, just unbelievable, and you know the I, the, the emotional uh, I had like self esteem problems. Uh, I I remember uh, I remember doing this 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 pen pal thing with this female uh, prisoner in Texas, and you know if you're new or just coming back, I don't recommend this. Uh, so, you know, somebody I knew was in prison and said, oh, you'd really like this girl, Shelly. Well, so I started writing her. Well, she moved in with me and mom, and I found out she was she was a Harley Hell Angel old lady from the Oakland chapter, okay? I'm telling you. She she had it all. She had the, the front teeth that she could pop out. She had the tattoos and, and wanted to always carry the guns, and and she had absolutely no no moral compunctions at all. She had absolutely no moral compass. It, it, if, it, if it was illegal, it would not phase her to do it. And uh, again, you know, this was like my last girlfriend before I got sober. Uh, this violent, psychotic criminal. Uh, and, 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 you know, and that relationship just destroyed me. And, you know, she, she ended up leaving me. You know, can you imagine? <laughs> and going back to, to, to prison or whatever. I think she's still in prison. Every once in a while, I still get a letter. You know, Mary Beth goes, what the hell is this? You know, she's trying to get money from me or something from prison. Anyway, so I'm really not, I'm really not able to handle a lot. I, I mean, I'm a bad electrician. 
uh, I, I've got like. I've got like a 19-year-old kid who's in charge of me. I'm like 32. I'm a bad electrician. I would do I would do crazy things like I'd drill down into people's closets by mistake and drag their suit coats up into the up into the attic, you know, and they'd be all mad at me. And uh, you know, I, I I wired a house to the wrong wrong uh, meter one time, and the whole kitchen would come on at eight o'clock at night and go off at six in the morning. You know, it was on a timer meter. I uh, I, I just was always doing crazy, stupid things. And again, I, I'm, I'm trapped inside myself. Well, the day comes that um, alcohol has got my attention so bad. And listen, I, I've lost my driver's license three times. I've, I've totaled nine cars in drunken blackouts by this time. I've lost my family. I've lost 10 jobs or 15 jobs in like 10 years. Uh, all of my friends have, have deserted me. I've got nothing except the bottle and the room in my mother's house. And you know what it was that got my attention? What got my attention was I was at work this one day, and I was trying to put a screw in uh, a ceiling fixture, uh, a ground screw. And I had, the, I had it on the end of the screwdriver, and I was shaking so badly that I couldn't do it. I kept dropping the screw. And this 19-year-old kid I told you about was looking at me, and he was looking at me like, you pathetic. Sorry, ass, good for nothing, no account. You make me sick. I mean, and that's what he was thinking, I'm sure, because I could tell. You can tell what, you know, if you're alcoholic, you can hear people thinking at you. So I couldn't take that. So I decided I'm going to sign myself into rehab. I'd been through CAI outpatient uh, earlier because of uh, multiple DWIs. So I knew I went there drunk, but I, I knew like if you if you really wanted to stop drinking, you know, there's there's some help for you. So I signed myself up to the, into this rehab, and I, I I felt very very superior. Now think about this: I felt superior because I was the only person in rehab who signed myself up without people pushing me. Everybody else that was in there was in there to try to not go to jail for a third DWI or because their bosses intervened and made them seek some help. So I was better than they were because I was sicker than they were. You know what I mean? So I had this air of superiority. I signed myself in. It's like, you know, I, I recognized I needed the booby hatch. You know, all of you were pushed in here. So, so anyway, I'm in CAI. And now the receiver, the receiver can always be wrong. Uh, the transmitter, I'm sure, was doing a much better job. But this is what I heard in rehab. When you get out of rehab, if you go to some AA meetings and you go to the outpatient that we ask you to, and you, and if you continue to, to, to not want to drink, everything is going to be fine. That's what I heard. Okay? So when I got out of rehab... I went to two AA meetings a week, two outpatient meetings a week. What more do you want from me, my God? And I certainly wanted to stay away from alcohol. I wanted to remain separated from alcohol with the best of them. Okay? There's, there's, there was never a person in an AA meeting who wanted to stay away from alcohol more than I did. I can swear to that because it near killed me in a hundred different ways. Well... One day I'm on my way to an AA meeting and the thought crosses my mind that it would be a good idea to put a gallon of vodka in my stomach. And that's what I did. Everything was not okay. Going to a couple of meetings and going to outpatient rehab and wanting to stay away from booze was not enough. Everything was not okay. I, I did about six months worth of relapse that, that ended up me threatening my entire family over Christmas. I'm going to kill all of you. You know, my, my mother, my, my brother, sister, nieces, nephews, cats, everybody. I'm going to kill all of you. And uh, uh, everything was not all right, God damn it. Um, I wake up, I wake up, and I have never been so emotionally crippled as that particular day. I was shattered. Uh, I made some phone calls. I thought I was thought I was going to die because I went into the DTs and I was hallucinating and I was I was violently 
uh, having uh, convulsions, and it was just really not good. You know, you ever see those old films with the guy fish flopping on the bed, all, all restrained and everything? Well, that was me, only I wasn't in a hospital and I wasn't restrained. I, you know, I, was, I was in the house over Christmas when everybody left. So um, I, I get through this somehow. I, I cry out to God, please help me. I get through this. And uh, I struggle off to an AA meeting. Now, I had, I had an alcoholic car at this time. Anybody ever have the alcoholic car? It was a 1976 Ford Granada. It had white walls. All the quarter panels were, were damaged. It had no clutch. It had no emergency brake. It had no muffler. It had no heater core. Because I was busy. <laughs> you know? How am I going to have time to fix this thing? So you turn on the heat. This is the middle of winter. You turn on the heat and it squirts antifreeze on the inside of the window. I mean, this was a real, this is a real wonder car. Well, because it didn't have a clutch, I had to find a meeting that was flat. So I had to look through the meeting book and find a flat meeting. And I find this meeting. It's the church, the, the Redeemer meeting, six o'clock Sunday, Morristown. It's flat. It's all 287. I get there. Now, the most embarrassing thing in the world is when people think at you, right? I mean, as an alcoholic, is that the worst when people think like badly of you? You know they're gonna. You know they are. I mean, that's like, that's like, that kills you. Well, here I am. I have to pull into this church and there's 700 alcoholics standing out on the church steps having cigarettes. And I've got to go up a little hill to get into the parking lot. And because there's no clutch, I've got to rev the crap out of this thing. So it's got no muffler. It, so, it sounds like an outboard motor. And I have to rev it. So I drive past 700 people having a cigarette like this. And they're all like looking at me. Like, you know, I'm, I'm like, <laughs> I have to park the thing against a tree because there's no clutch, no emergency brake. It'll roll. So I park it against a tree and I walk in. Now I'm already embarrassed, right? I walk into the meeting and I sit down. And they, somebody hands me a, a step book, and they're reading the step. You know, the step meetings where you, everybody reads a paragraph, and then when you're done, it's open to sharing. Well, that's well, that was what this was like. And and they're coming down the row at me before I could figure out what the hell was going on. They're coming down the row at me, and I'm going to have to read a paragraph. No way! I can't even hold the book. I'm still shaking. I'm still detoxing. And I go, ah, I can't read a paragraph. So I get up and I walk out of the meeting and I'm standing out on the steps having a cigarette. And it's one of those one of those points in time where I'm either going to leave and probably go drink and kill myself or there's got to be some kind of divine intervention. I mean, it's it's one of those points in time. We, we all have them. And this guy comes walking out. I'll never forget. His name is Jorge. He comes out and he starts talking. With me. And he goes, well, what's your deal? I said, oh, the relapse is horrible. And, and he goes, well, why don't you, why don't you come on back into the meeting and, and sit down and we'll, we'll finish the meeting together. And I go, well, there's a meeting tomorrow night in Bass and Garage. He goes, there's a meeting tomorrow night. I'm just drinking my ass. He goes, he knew, he, he knew what tomorrow meant for an alcoholic. He goes, no, come on in and sit down. And he grabs me by the arm and he drags me in and we sit down right in the second row. Now, thank God by this time they're not reading from the paragraphs anymore. And I'm, I'm sitting there like this. And, you know, listening to people share their stuff, not even understanding a bit of it. And he, he turns to me and he goes, now raise your hand and tell everybody you're coming back. And I go, well, there's a meeting tomorrow night. There's a meeting tomorrow night. And they ask you if you're new in this meeting. And I'll, you know, I'll raise my hand when they ask me that. He goes, raise your hand and tell everybody you're coming back. Now he's getting loud. And what happens when somebody's getting loud at you? People are going to start to look at you, right? It's only a few seconds away from them they're going to be thinking at you. So i got to do something. So I shoot my hand up finally because this, he's not going to shut up. I shoot my hand up right in the middle of somebody sharing. And the leader like looks like, like, like this and, 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 and cu cuts the person off who's talking. <laughs> it's beautiful. And calls on me. And I say something like, oh, it's Chris, you're drinking, it's horrible, it's horrible, so it's going to come back and relapse, so thank you. And everybody, there's a, there's, a, there's a couple of second pause, and then everybody goes, yeah, and they're all clapping like, yeah, like you are the most pathetic thing we've seen for weeks. You've just cheered all of us up with the absolute utter misery of your life. Thank you so much. 
You know, and uh, so right at that moment in time, I, my emotional condition up to that point in time was not strong enough for me to get back into AA and to do what I needed to do. I, I couldn't have faced it. After doing that, the wall of fear started to crumble a little bit. That wall of anxiety that was keeping me from going where I needed to go to survive. And, uh, you know, from that time, I haven't, uh, I haven't had a, a drink or a drug. Uh, and that was, uh, that was at the very end of 1989 and between uh, Christmas and New Year's. And that's, that's when I celebrate. Now, I started to get sober. You've got to understand, an alcoholic of my type, it's stark raving sobriety for a while for somebody like me. I had been used to, for the last 20 years, I had been used to completely anesthetizing myself with alcohol. Just, just shutting down whatever feelings that were coming to the surface. I need to shut them down with alcohol. So, um, so all of a sudden, I've got no alcohol, I've got no drugs. I'm like, you know, I am wide awake and I am raving lunatic sober. And I start going to meetings. Out of desperation, I'm going to anywhere between 7 and 13 meetings a week. And I hook up with a sponsor and uh, I get involved in all this, the fellowship activity. Now, uh, inside, when I was that kindergartner, I had to make a decision to act as if everything was okay. I had to do that to be able to face kindergarten and school, all through school. I, every day I walked through those doors, I had to act as if I wasn't afraid. And, I, and I, I had to act as if I wasn't anxious about it all and uncomfortable about it all. Well, that's what I'm doing now in AA. I'm going to a lot of meetings and I'm acting as if everything's okay. Hey, Chris, how you doing? Well, okay. Everything fine? Yeah, everything, everything's you know, going good. Everything's fine. You know, what, what I, if I was to be completely honest, I would, I would say something like, I'm absolutely homicidal lunatic in my mind. I, you know, if, if I don't want to kill you, you know, I, I want to just shoot myself. I, I can't, you know, I can't take it. And I'm pretending everything's okay. How are you? Is what I would say to somebody if I was honest. Uh, uh, you know, I remember a counselor uh, in uh, in rehab asked me one time. I was like raving about something, you know, some resentment, you know, it was some unfair practice at this rehab. You know, somebody can do this and somebody can't do that. It's unfair. And this uh, this counselor looks at me and goes, "Can you tell me about your feelings? Are you happy, mad, sad, or glad?" You know, don't ever say that to like a raving alcoholic. Because they don't know. Every single negative emotion in the world is like thrown into a blender and turned on ten. And, you know, whatever pops out the top is what pops out the top. You know, we can't really distinguish between them. So here I am, um, I'm sober and uh, I'm really, really not happy. I would do things like I had this friend, Radio Shack Mike, and he used to, he used to be the brave soul that would go to meetings with me. You know, we, We'd, uh, we'd drive the meetings together, and then we'd, we'd drive to the diner, and then we'd drive home. And the whole time I'd be complaining about so-and-so in that meeting, that hypocrite, that son of a that, that lying bastard. You know, I can't believe it. Do you, do you believe if so-and-so shares again, I'm just going to kill myself, or I'll kill him. I can't take it anymore. I can't, I can't listen to that guy anymore. I mean, I was like vomiting resentment. And, and I'm like two or three months sober. And... This Radio Shack Mike would, he was a lunatic anyway. He'd be driving, he'd be like, you know, I'd be making him grateful, you know, with, uh, uh, I'd made a lot of people grateful in those early days. Well, he actually was, was a piece of the puzzle that aimed me toward emotional recovery. Because he had a set of tapes, and he goes, Chris, you're hardcore. You'd like listening to that. Now, he had given me tapes before. He gave me some of these Louise Hay affirmation tapes. I mean, he'd just listen to anything. Here I am. I'm a raving alcoholic, and he gives me these tapes. And you're supposed to stand in front of the mirror and go, I'm a wonderful guy. I'm a wonderful guy. Like 35 times or until you actually believe it. Now, can you imagine? I'm standing in front of the mirror. I'm a wonderful guy? You know, it just doesn't work. It's like trying to stop a semi with a cobweb, you know, trying to work on my alcoholism with Louise Hay tapes. Anyway, somebody had given him a set of Joe and Charlie tapes, and he go, he couldn't deal with them, you know. 
And, and he goes, he goes, here, Chris, you're hardcore. You'll probably like these guys. And he was wrong about that because I hated people from Arkansas. And these guys are from Arkansas, right? I hate Arkansasians. I'm not real partial to Oklahomians either. You know what I mean? When, what is somebody from Arkansas going to teach me? How to, how to place the straw twixt my teeth? You know what I mean? What, what am I going to learn from these guys? But I've got a long ride to work, so, so I put him in and I start listening. And to boil down the message, this is the message that finally emerged from these tapes. Chris, you have no program. You are, all you're doing is, all you're doing is circling around and through the fellowship. If you don't open the book Alcoholics Anonymous and take the spiritual exercises found therein, you will not have a program and you will probably die if you're really alcoholic. Now, I, I, the meetings I used to go to in the old days, you never heard anything like that. You didn't hear about the steps. There was always a cranky old timer in the meetings I went to. Somebody who had like, like cranky old timer status. You know what I mean? Like, like, uh, like Horatio Gerbil Feather, you know? Well, Horatio Gerbil Feather says, and they would always have these little one-liner, uh, wisdom teachings, like, they, they, a couple of, you know, they were a dying breed when, when I got sober, thank God. But anyway, well, one of them had come up and they'd say something like, kid, underneath every skirt's a slip. And I'd go, whoa! And they would say things like, kid, if you never drink, you won't get drunk. And, you know, I mean, if you're like me, burdened with a mind, you know, like, 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 like a nursery school philosophy like that is just hard to deal with. I'm thinking, well, if I never juggle chainsaws, I won't cut my kneecap off either. I mean, you know, what difference does it make? I, 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 that's not my problem. And, uh, and sometimes they'd get cranky, these, these old timers. I remember this one guy was parading around uh, telling everybody, kid, you're too stupid to do a four-step. I mean, and that's, this is what he would tell people, come to find out. He never did a four-step, so he didn't think you needed to. And there was just, there was, there was these guys, and, and there was not a lot of people really talking about recovery. And I found it on the tapes. I found it on the tapes. And I am not going to say I did a good job going through the steps the first time. I did an adequate job. I opened up the book, uh, I did the four column inventory, I, I would listen to the Joe and Charlie tapes, you know, and, and uh, I, I showed up at my sponsor's house with, uh, with an inventory and he goes, what's that list thing? Where's your story? You know, I mean, you know, so it was a long time ago and um, uh, what happened was I began to heal emotionally. Uh, Addressing the steps was the beginning of emotional recovery, emotional sobriety for me. Uh, the, the fellowship was not addressing that aspect of it. What the fellowship was doing was all that fellowship activity was keeping me away from the booze, which is important. Please, uh, please understand that's where it starts. But that, that, that scared kindergartner was still just, just really, really crying out in me until I started going through the steps. My first run through the steps, uh, I, uh, I experienced some, some real relief from some of those really devastating, emotional, uh, traumatic type, uh, type feelings and experiences. I stuck, listen, it, it took a long, long time for me to get to, uh, to where I am today, which is, I, I truly can say today I'm recovered, uh, from a hopeless state of, uh, of body, mind, and spirit. I really am. But it took a lot of time. It took a lot of step work. It took a lot of meetings. It took a lot of service work. But in the, in the beginning, I, I would not have made it much longer without some type of emotional recovery. I just wouldn't have. And I don't think that we do because, because you, you, can, you can become dependent on the fellowship. You can have fellowship dependence for only so long. And then one day you're just not going to go to a meeting every single night. You're just not going to do 14 meetings a week. And when that happens, now you're going to become exposed and you'll end up, you'll end up drinking. So there's a, there's a, there's a more serious, uh, serious answer, answer there. Um, here I am, um, 
I've gone through the steps. Now I'm sponsoring some people. Um, and some of them are drinking on me. You ever sponsor people that drink on you? You know what I mean? They make you look bad. People come up to you in meetings and go, hey, do you know so-and-so is drinking? And, or even worse, borrowing money from people, you know? So, so, I mean, making you look bad. So, I figure there's this one guy who just can't stop drinking. He's getting DWIs every week. I bring him over to my house and uh, I say, look, I went through this book. Let's go through this book together. Let's, let's, I'm going to, I'm going to show you what I did and maybe we'll learn a little bit more together. And I, I brought him over to my house and we, we started, uh, we started going through the book. And all of a sudden, it became a meeting in my house. Like every Thursday night, he would come over. And then, and then he started bringing friends, and people heard about it. They wanted to come over. So it ended up being a meeting. But one of the things that I learned was it was very good for me to go through this process over and over again with these people. Because I'd do a fourth step, too. And I'd do a fifth step, too. I didn't want them to think that I'm telling them to do stuff that I won't do. So I'm, I'm starting to work the steps like crazy. Now... I found out something very significant. The significant thing is, is the people who went through the steps back then, uh, the people who went through are still sober. And they're taking people through the steps. And there's a whole group of them from, you know, back around 1995 or so who, uh, who, who were really, really powerful uh, and important members in Alcoholics Anonymous because of the amount of, uh, of recovery work they do with other people. So... So anyway, uh, I learned that lesson. Um, over the course of the years, I, I would heal more and more. Every single year, I'd heal, heal more and more uh, emotionally. Um, I don't think we ever get to the point where we're perfect. I, I, I wouldn't really want that. I, 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 like, I like getting better every single year. It gives me something to look forward to. Um, one of the one of the things uh, one of my sponsors taught me way back early on was this. I was celebrating 90 days and I was a wreck because I was going to stand up in front of like 100 people and take a 90 day chip and I had to say something, you know. And uh, this is way before the steps, so so I was scared to death. And he looked at me and I was just a bundle of anxiety. And, and here's what he said: He goes, Chris, man, I'm glad I'm not you. Man, I'm glad I'm not at 90 days. I never want to go back to where you are. I'm like, thanks, Phil. And he goes, but let me tell you something. I'm glad I'm not at, at where I was at a year. I, he goes, he was celebrating 10 years. He goes, I'm glad I'm not the same person I was at nine years. Now, I'll even go better than that. I'm glad I'm not the same person I was last month. And what he was telling me was he was telling me that recovery is progressive. Recovery, uh, it gets better and better and better according to your level of participation and according to your, uh, uh, your, your diligence in seeking, uh, seeking to improve uh, your, your conscious contact with God. And I, uh, I believe that today. Um, I, used to, I used to cut school when there was an oral report because I couldn't even fathom speaking in front of a small class of people. Not only would I cut the day I was supposed to give my oral report, I'd cut for like a week after in case there was makeup days. I mean, I didn't want to take any chances of having to get up in front of, in front of the class. Now I do public speaking all over the place, you know, for, for a, a bunch of different things. And I, I really have no problem with it, you know. Uh, sometimes I think I do better, uh, I give better presentations than others, but <clears throat> I never have any anxiety about it. I never have any fear about it. That's an example of emotional recovery. You know, I used to have road rage. I used to follow two. If you're, if you're not doing 45 and a 45 at least, you know, I'm expecting you to do 50, by the way, and a 45. But if you're not at least doing 45, I am going to tailgate your ass so close, you know, all the way to the meeting so that I can share on serenity. And, and that's what I would do. I had this road rage. I'll kill you. I mean, you ever follow somebody past your exit? You know, just to recut them off. I mean, I've done that. Uh, that was me. All of a sudden, one day, like that, road rage was removed. And I had none of it anymore, unless, you know, your Klim could diddle goddamn hopper. You know, going about five miles an hour, then, then it might re resurrect its ugly head. Uh, but for the most part, you know, 99% of the time, I'm okay with it all. Uh, some of the things that are going on in my life only because of emotional recovery is 
Uh, I'm now not a bad electrician. I'm actually uh, I'm actually a general manager of uh, of an account where I run the business, uh, and it's hands off. I have a I have a district manager, but he stops in about three or four times a year just to pat me on the head and tell me I'm doing great. Uh, I run the whole business. I do the human resources. I do the hiring and firing. I've learned how to fire people, you know, without worrying about what they think about me. That's that's uh, that was something. Um, you know, I'm in charge of all the finances. I'm doing the computer work and the Excel sheets and the, the monthly financial reporting. And I'm doing all this, and 50 people report to me, and I'm okay with it all. Uh, I don't have a lot of anxiety. I actually enjoy being at work, and and I work in a crazy place. Um, I'm I'm pretty active in Alcoholics Anonymous. I still do a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, organizational work for seminars and workshops and things like that. I still do that. Uh, I get a chance to speak at a lot of a lot of places like this, which I'm always grateful for. It's always good for me, um, and that's a good thing. Uh, you know, I I married another alcoholic, which you got to be real careful about. You know what I mean? Uh, but uh, this is this has worked out real well. We're celebrating 10 years, uh, our 10 year anniversary next month. If you can imagine, 10 years married, and uh, we've had some good times and we've had some bad times. We're in a good year right now. You know, we're we're having a really really good year, and uh, we we truly are best friends, and we truly are learning how to live with each other. You know, as an alcoholic, do not marry a person. Marry the idea of marriage. You know what I'm saying? Because there's not a knucklehead out there worth being married to. I gotta tell you right now, there isn't. You, you have to make a commitment to the marriage institution and then learn how to work it out with the person that you chose. You just really do. And that's Chris's relationship seminar in a nutshell right there. Um, some other things that are happening. Um, I've always, I've always really loved music. If you show up at my house, this has probably happened to some of the people in here, I won't let you go until you hear that next song. You've got to hear this guitar solo. It's unbelievable. This guy's unbelievable. And I'll trap you in my music room until you've heard, like, Alan Holdsworth's solo from 1977 or something, you know. And I just love music. I've been passionate about music. I have about 30,000 CDs. I've always been an avid music collector. I understand a lot about music. Professional musicians come to me to ask me questions about things. I really, really love music. And this guy I know had a little studio in his basement. And uh, the, the idea came to us to, uh, to film, some, film some, some stuff and see if a, a cable TV channel will want it. And strangely enough, well, the demo we put together... Uh, there's a cable TV channel called Patriot Media Channel 8. Said, we love it. We'll give you Friday night at 11.30 till 12.30 every single week. So I'm the host of a cable TV show uh, with live musicians. We uh, Last weekend, we uh, we filmed this band, Burkana, which, I mean, they, they got, they're incredible musicians. Uh, uh, we, go in, we go into the city and film things. We, we, we filmed something with uh, Paul Schaefer and the, the cast of The Sopranos a couple of weeks ago. It was pretty fun. Um, and we're doing this show. And, um, I mean, the only reason I'm saying this is because I, I never could have gone anywhere near any of this stuff without emotional recovery. It wouldn't have been possible for me. I would have figured out how it wouldn't work. Or I would have figured out why it would be really uncomfortable and I'll just ra- I'd rather not get involved. With, with emotional recovery, you have the ability to get involved. You have the freedom to get involved. You're not crippled. You're not in bondage to self and worrying about things. You're, you're actually able to grow and blossom in ways that are, are, are miraculous. I mean, you know, I, never in my wildest dreams, uh, would I have, would I have you know, thought that some of the things that are happening to me today uh, would have happened. I just got a job offer, eighteen thousand dollars a year more than I'm making now. This, this other district wants me. I mean, you know, I've got to worry now about like you know this new job offer. I mean, that's the biggest problem in my life is that. And uh, again, you know, uh, I got to tell you, uh, 
I'm at the hour here, and I'm just waiting for Mike to give me one of these. No, um, I got to tell you, I am I am what I'm what is known as a grateful alcoholic today. I really am. Every single positive thing in my life is a direct result of the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous and my meager participation in it. Um, the craziest thing I see on a day-to-day basis is alcoholics that don't embrace this thing with everything they've got. That's the craziest thing I see. And uh, the 12-step tells me that I need to carry a message of depth and weight to those people. And uh, that's what I really try to do. And I want to thank this group for, uh, for asking me to come up here and speak today. Uh, I really appreciate it. And that's all I got. Thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.